Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tech Gig Webinars, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key of enhancing our performances and for our growth as professionals. With this principle in mind, Tech Gig has initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give a crisp insight of various domains. Topic for today's session is Building Large Data Warehouses Leveraging SQL Server 2008 and SQL Server 2012. We are delighted to have Mr. Shiram Jayaraman, Director of Technology, Sapien Global Markets with us today. Shiram has over 15 years of enormous experience in architecting, designing and building enterprise class scalable distributed systems leveraging Microsoft technologies. His prime focus is on building large-scale data-driven applications leveraging Microsoft technologies. Shiram has been an active speaker in events like TechEd, Microsoft User Groups and ASUG Worldwide. Gentlemen, this presentation will continue for next 45 minutes and we will take your questions after the presentation. In the meanwhile, you can post your queries through the chat pane available in the webinar software. Without further ado, I introduce you to our guest speaker, Mr. Shriram. Welcome to everyone and I hope all of you are out of your graveyard shift which is between 2 to 3 after lunch and everybody has the energy to go to this topic. Primarily the focus of this topic is to share our experiences based upon the industry which we are working in which is pretty much a lot data intensive on some of the best practices and some of the best information and resources which we can leverage to build large data warehouses using SQL Server. Primarily there has been perceptions saying that SQL Server is not scale and performance with SQL Server is a problem. But contrary to that, right now scale and performance is not something which we are seeing as a problem in SQL Server. It's the level of optimized usage of the features is what we are seeing as a problem with the SQL Server. Let me now take a focus into that of what our agenda is for the session today. First and foremost, we want to talk about what is the scope of a data warehouse? There is always a lot of overlap between that of where people start looking at a data warehouse vis-a-vis -vis that of a business intelligence platform. A data warehouse is not necessarily a holistic business intelligence platform, but it's a part or a very critical part of your data warehouse. We would want to discuss about what is the approach which has been foundationally followed most of the time when we work with customers' places and what is the challenge which we have seen with that particular conventional approach. Microsoft, we leverage a lot of one particular reference architecture or data warehousing architecture given to us as Microsoft called as the fast track reference data warehouse. We will discuss why fast track is important because we have seen that it's a very relevant data warehousing architecture for warehouses which are 2 to 10 terabytes of data. 1 terabyte we still don't consider large. So when we say large, or from our perspective, there's 2 to 10 terabytes which we consider as large. Anything beyond 10 to that of hundreds of terabytes, we still consider as very large databases. That's, uh, that's the next area which we'll be covering about, which is how do we use a scalar kind of an infrastructure with our parallelism using SQL Server parallel data warehouse features and implement very large data warehouses because that also is a growing need in our industry because for compliance, people keep hundreds of terabytes of data. So how do we build parallel data warehouses which are for very large data, which is like 10 to hundreds of terabytes? And across the session, we will be having certain best practices which Microsoft has recommended and which we have also applied in our product from a data architecture best practices perspective. You can feel free to type in the questions at any given point of time when you want to, but I will prefer handling them at the last point because you know, we, so we are not doing live face-to-face very interrupting into question and can come back to you and answer right away. It will be preferable that I don't disturb the flow and then I answer the questions at the last point when we finish that process. Let's first discuss the first part of the agenda, which is data warehousing scope and what are the challenges which is faced with the conventional model. For, uh, from our point of view, the scope of a data warehouse is primarily not your ETL jobs or how you build your cube or how you deliver your reports or 
or how you deliver it using your reporting platform, dashboards, or scorecards using performance on services. Our focus when we think about the data warehouses, number one, how do you stage your data? How do you bulk load your data? How do you distribute and feed your data warehouse? And how optimally and efficiently you use either your storage areas or a dedicated SAM. Now that's the next area of debate which I'll be getting down to in discussing it in detail how both these particular aspects work across. Let's talk today how does the conventional data warehouses get built. Most of the enterprises have invested in one big SAM. It might be exabytes of storage or multiple terabytes of storage. They come back, add a little server, take some amount of storage space from that particular server, now from that SAM. Now please note this particular SAM does not is not dedicated or balanced for your data warehouse workload. It can consist of an OLTP database. It can consist of multiple content databases. It can consist of multiple static databases, which are still maintained as workload. So the SAN is like your storage area or your warehouse, which is not having compartmentalized warehouses where you pick up the relevant data. So the server, however performing it is, has limited control over that of how much of performance it can deliver for your data warehouse. Okay, you need a better performance, you have multiple more servers. Now again, when you have more servers, your HPA port rate might be impacted, your disk read rate might be impacted, your SQL Server read ahead rate might be impacted. There might be a risk of a lot of potential bottlenecks which will open up. Not necessarily in every case this bottleneck will hit because we have used this particular model for ages to build in SQL Server so data warehousing architectures which are approximately on 600 gig or 700 gig or 800 gig. In fact, in the same architecture, even with SQL 2000, when I was working with Microsoft in SQL 2000, we could build a one terabyte by data warehouse and scale it up. But the question here is, of what is the problem with this, is that traditionally data warehousing scenarios have been exclusive to large enterprises because when you want to build a data warehouse, the perception is that it's a luxury. It's not something which you need every time. Okay? Now, because of compliance requirements and because of what I would call as either costless or less costlier, powerful BI tools such as power pivot or reporting services, data and information needs to be delivered. Number one is it needs to be stored primarily because of the reason of compliance. You can't escape it. Because, and particularly with dot crimes and everything happening in our industry, we just can't risk losing out on that particular area. We must store that data. Now the thing is, once you have that data, how do you monetize it across the value chain, right from the CEO of an organization to downstream? That's where self-service tools like for BI, power pivot and reporting services are giving significant amount of value where DWs can be harnessed and consumed. So more or less most of the businesses which we work with needs a data warehouse. Or if not a full-fledged data warehouse, it needs probably multiple data marks to be built within the enterprise and having it across. That's something which we have seen as a necessity in many user cases. But the challenge with that is if you look at the server model which we discussed in the past, the server is actually like the guy who is carrying multiple boxes. It comes from the disk. You don't know how, what speed it comes in. It just leverages the processor space and then tries to lift it across and deliver. So what happens is that the synchronization between your processing power or memory power with your storage is number one unstructured. The second one is you might have great CPU power, but your disk and HPA power is not going to respond to that. The CPU power might not be great. For example, you can have four core processes in your system which says that what do you call it, I can process almost 800 gig in a second. But if my storage is not going to process that amount of volume because it also has a mixed workload, there is no balance. So you invest a lot on your service, you invest a lot on your storage, but you are not optimizing it from a total return of investment from what you are using it for from your data warehouse. Last but not the least, the problem which is there is it's unpredictable. Now if you have a problem, I'll show you the next slide where you can go back and point it out into 10 different areas. This is the classic situation. Your disk people might say the server is the problem, the CPU feed rate is the problem, or the hardware person might say SQL Server read ahead rate is the problem. And if you have a fiber channel switch for your SAN, SAN, there might be a bottleneck with your switch port rate. Or your storage controller, you might have a problem with your SP port rate. And in your storage SAN, you might have a problem with the LAN read rate or the disk read rate. So what happens in this case of the current model is that there are too many points in which you can probably have a bottleneck and it is going to take a lot of time in order to resolve it 
And not only that, you have invested a lot of money in storage, and primarily you may say that the lion's share of it which I mean is I'm using it just for the data warehouse, and that's not getting you the return on investment. And there is also performance and maintenance over it, which you are investing as you are going by across. This is where the fast track data warehouse comes into play. Now, what does fast track data warehouse offer fundamentally is an aligned and balanced approach where your CPU, your core, your storage, your network, your HPA channels, all of them are as one unit is balanced for your specific workload. I'll discuss how does it do it in detail next. What it is, is actually a prescriptive methodology and concrete example. And when we say it's a concrete example, it's not only a software example. It also has a lot of dependency on hardware and how you configure your database. And it's a marriage between multiple partners of Microsoft and Microsoft. Needless to say, the software guidances which we will be discussing in, in this particular session, which are primarily focused upon SQL Server, also applies for not necessarily only a fast track data warehouse. It is specific to a workload, and we will discuss the kind of workloads where we have applied this particular practice, and it has worked out very efficiently for us. So what we have seen as the value proposition is that most of the fast track partners, they have balanced the spending of CPU and storage resources such that you can ensure the maximum bang for the buck. And any fast track data warehouse reference architecture uses the TPC H kind of a benchmark in order to benchmark their out of the box performance. Now TPC H, as you all know, is a data warehouse in benchmark. So they benchmark and they come back saying that for this particular workload, this is the kind of performance the server can offer. Now the next cycle is it's a it's a benchmark for the hardware, but not necessarily for your workload. But what you can do is you can leverage this particular reference architecture with the particular hardware which you are having, such that instead of having a one-size-fits-all approach for database configuration, you have a specific workload case or a data warehouse workload which you are focusing on building your capacity and planning also your investments. Okay. What kind of workloads or fast track data warehouses can be used for? Now the first thing which is there is that one thing, if I would like to give you an example of what we talk about here as scan and send, intensive. Imagine you guys are having analysis services. You need to load the data from the data warehouse from the analysis services. What you are going to do most of the time is that you are going to scan the entire set of fact tables and load it. Okay? And there might be the incremental loading process which is happening, which is going to happen whenever incremental data comes in on a daily basis or whatsoever. Now, the thing here is that in this kind of a case, you're not going and selecting for a particular record, or you're not searching for a particular record. So in this case, what needs to happen is that the scan performance of your workload has to be very well. Okay, so that's what the data warehousing reference architecture intends to do. Okay, why? Because if your scan is continuously organized, your data processing also happens much more faster, and your reporting systems eventually, when they work with your NDX engine or anything of that kind, can deliver data on a much more effective fashion. The next thing is that this is particularly relevant to our industry is that most of the data which today because of compliance is a record. For example, in the transactional system, if somebody even goes back and then edits a particular record, we might still have it as a separate record because we need to have the archive and the history of the data changes in our industry. So it is very important that the, that the data is rarely changed once loaded into the data warehouse. You can change it in your OLTP system, but once it is loaded, it is not going to be changed too much. It's just incremental loads which is happening. And why we are saying that is because, as we said, the goal should be in order to have better scan performance. And if your disk is have fragmented, your scan performances are not going to be great. Okay? You might use indexes, but not too many non-cluster indexes, which is a convention which we use with OLTP systems. I'll discuss later why not, not too many non-cluster indexes. And needless to say, because these are large data volumes, you will definitely have a partitioning strategy aligned to it. So these are the four characteristics which you need to apply for a fast track data okay, or a fast track reference architecture. If none of these characteristics are applied, you just have a simple database on which you want to do an operational reporting directly from the data and not too much big in size, these guidelines not necessarily need to apply. Okay. When you load the data, Okay, when we load data generally in SQL Server, the best practice, the practice which we used to think is that each page is 8K, so the average request size should be 8K when you actually load it across. Okay, 
we shouldn't be doing it because higher prescribed movement is going to imply lower performance in terms of accelerated load. So what we need to do is instead of thinking 8K as the average request size for loading data, you need to think each request is a minimum of 400K in order to load the data. So don't think about at the page size, think at a much larger volume when you think about loading data. Now, the lesser number of operations which you have and why we are saying that it has to be bigger is that instead of running 200k requests running across to load the data, if I have, I mean, 400k requests, obviously your processing is going to be much more hardware. And the next thing which happens is that because the hardware architecture is balanced to your processor and in fast track 3.0, these are specific to fast track 3.0 where the storage architecture uses rate 10 lumps. Okay. Now, rate 10, as you move, offers the best level of performance in any kind of test configuration. So, it can sustain up, up to probably what we have seen is you can comfortably load up to 200 MB, MBs per second. And I am talking about an AMD Optron based per port with the rate 10 run. We were able to load somewhere around 200 MBs per second. But there are plan, where you plan really well is that number one, what is your destination table? How is it partitioned? And what is your file grid? Next is your source data, what is this format and size. Because why this is important is that if you will discuss that in with illustrations later. Let's say for example, you need to do a first time data load and you have a data load of let's say a 64 gig of file which needs to be loaded up course. They can probably do a simple direct bulk insert into a staging table and then push it through. Simply because of the fact until the 64 GB memory limit and the 16 core processor limit, it can get loaded directly into the pocket. But let's say if the data volumes are higher, then you need to get a little bit of creative. That's why one is what is your format? For example, loading flat files are going to be always much more faster than that of loading an XML file or pulling data from somewhere else because that's the way it works. And then how you plan your loading methodology is very clearly dependent upon how much of CPUs you have, which means number of cores you have and how much of memory you have along with it. Always it's obvious I don't need to mention the more it is better. Okay? But at the hindsight, when I, before I discuss the scenario, I am going to imagine that we are going to get flat files. The first thing which we normally do is we, lead, we load flat files into a heap table. Now what do we mean by a heap table? A heap table, what do we mean is that a table which does not have any indexes. Again, the goal here, why we are not using, why we are not using a table without any indexes is because we want each of the records which we load into the loaded into the contiguous sequence. Okay? And if you have a contiguous scan on disk, the performance is going to be much better. Now, let's assume that you have a partition scheme which is created for actually in the data errors, not in the staging table, but in the final tables of the final setup. So what we do is we do a very critical activity where we align the staging tables in order to be aligned with the partition scheme which you are using for the final, final tables. If you need press cluster indexes, you should create it. But what we recommend is that use cluster indexes on columns, which is going to work on a range, not on something which is going to work across a mass data. Anything which is going to be scanned and let's say a fact table which you are completely loading, using a cluster index there might not be sensible. But if you are going to use a range, let's say for example, date of a transaction, there a cluster index might make a lot of sense. And eventually we use partition switching in order to make the staging table partitions in the final production table. And this kind of an approach, what we saw was fast track 2.0 was a reference architecture which is available for uh, SQL Server 2008. But what Microsoft says and what we also believe based upon certain scenarios which we are trying out is that this method can reduce your load time by 50% as compared with the previous methods in fast track 2.0. Okay, if you want to know these alternative methods, you can definitely go into the fast track 3.0 reference tag. Okay? It is downloadable and particular vendors might have particular references which are available for you. Let's first discuss the scenario which we were talking about. I have eight source, of source data files which are flat files. The server which I have is an eight core server. Then on the destination I have a table which is primarily a partition with a partition with clustered indexes. Okay, so it has two partitions. C1 in, in file group A it has two partitions. File group B it has two partitions. C and D it has two partitions. What is the first step which we carry out? Let's see. 
first step which we will be carrying out probably is using, because you have eight cores anyways, what we do is we use eight concurrent block inserts into a base deep staging table. As I said, a deep table in the staging, this, there's something which does not have any cluster indexes or no indexes at all. The next step what we do is that, as we said, remember the previous slide, we want to align the staging power of tables partitioning scheme to that of the cluster index partitioning scheme which we have as the destination table, actually a final table. So what we do is we use an insert into select into eight of these heat staging tables across. That's the next step where we do the stage insert. So the base load is done. The next step which we are actually doing is the stage insert. After which we actually map two of those stage tables to each of those CIs, two cluster index partitions which we have. Okay. So we drop it and then pull this body, we replace the data with these two cluster index stage partitions. Final step, and after we do these two steps, we will have four concurrent processes running in order to create a cluster index with compression into the final destination. Finally, we do a partition switch. Partition switch is a feature which is there available in SQL Server right from 2.8 and 2.8 R2 in 2012. You can think about leveraging that particular option in order to just swap the data and push it across. That was for a bulk load or migrating the first part of your data. Let's now discuss the second scenario where we wanted to discuss across how do we do an incremental load. Now, the way we do an incremental load is that it's simple. We use a source data file with a bulk interest because it's not well, this data is not volatile. Nothing changed in the data, it's just additional data. And then we use the degree of parallelism less, let's say 8 core server, we use the degree of parallelism less than 8 because we don't want all the processes to be consumed for this incremental data load. Sometimes we use one, sometimes we use two, but preferably we don't want to consume every one of them and then get the target database loaded. Let's talk about what if the data is volatile. Now, this is where it gets a little bit ugly, but that is what it is. And that's why we say that the target data in the data error should not be volatile. The only best way in which the minute you use DML statements on a data warehouse, that is insert, update, or delete kind of records kind of a statement, what is going to happen is that you increase the probability of your disk fragmentation. We definitely don't want that to happen because when it happens, then your disk performance goes into drops. So you first you execute a certain DDL statement, might be a drop table and then create it across, and then you might have a current and historical partitions across. Then you create a union coding the primary view. You can create a view which is actually using the union clause for the holding as well as the primary tables. Then we do an incremental load of bulk insert and then whatever partition switching or movement which we want to do, we will do it. Now, I'm not a big fan of this, but right now this is the best way you can do it if your data is volatile. Okay, if you notice right from the first slide, I've been talking about this can efficient disk performance, which is very critical irrespective of efficient core process performance or anything. So, how will you know when a disk is performing really well? You will know that only based upon how well your disk is fragmented. Now, please don't go ahead and run your disk fragmenter in your servers because that's a risky for disaster. Avoid any of your NTFS tools in order to manage your disk fragmentation in SQL. The first thing which we need to do is evaluate the page fragmentation. Now, this is a query which you have, which you can just pop, pop, copy and paste and try it if you have a slide deck or anything. This query is actually available on the fast track reference stack. What you can do is when you run this query, you will know what is the average fragment sizes in pages. And what we want is a value higher than that of 4. So when you run this query with the DMVs and the system tables which are available, this would be the result. And if this was for a TPC H750 gig workload, as you notice, it is pretty healthy in terms of, if you follow these best practices, it's pretty healthy in terms of the average fragment sizes in pages. We talked about how does it work across in terms of the CPU balancing to the disk. We are having an illustration here where we have a server with two cores, four different sockets on the core, on the servers with the fiber switch, and then two HPA cores. If you notice, what it does is for each of these four CPUs are directly attached to that particular storage enclosure. So 
It's like the performance is balanced and directly attached to the server. Now, does these disks run on a, in the hardware configuration? Does these uh, disks actually run on a separate SAN? Most of the cases not. Actually, what happens is these are storage arrays which are directly attached to your processor. And that's how most of the fast track reference data and those appliances are built and delivered across. The first thing which is important when you go back and try to collect a particular server is that you need to understand what is the standardized MCR for the CPU. Now, what, what is an MCR is that on a given second, how much data can be maximum consumed by that particular unit or that particular port is what a maximum consumption rate is. For example, let's say if I have an eight-way AMD Optron machine and then I have disks which are attached to it, if it can consume 1.6 GB per second, that's its maximum consumption rate. Now, this testing, you might not have done it or you don't need to do it. Actually, the maximum consumption rate will be available from the hardware vendor if you want to implement this architecture as such. Now, based upon the maximum consumption rate, you know how much data you are going to have. You can estimate what is the storage requirement, what is my requirement for storage requirement, storage network, and create an initial system design. Okay, you have it saying that, okay, this is what I need, but you need to validate whether this particular volumes which you are discussing is actually going to be achieved. That's where your benchmarking and your workload comes into picture. You cannot just invest on a server or these hardware based upon, you know, this is what they are pricing, let's say, that it costs so much. But because the TPC-H workload might be different from, most of them use the TPC-H workload, might be different from that of actually your data warehousing workload. So if you need to do it, what we need to do is that we need to do real SQL server testing. And for that, different criteria are, what is the different levels of concurrencies, and what is the hybrid mix of queries which you are going to use. We can't just bombard it with one query and say, oh yeah, it is going to perform it. So the recommendation is, Benchmark it for 80% of your use cases. You can't expect a 100% use case benchmarking because you might not even evaluate those many number of scenarios. So the recommendation is benchmark it for 80% of the use cases for various queries. As I said, once you have the benchmark or what you, you completed your benchmark and if it is at least achieving the 80% of the baseline rates with validated MCRs, then that's the right kind of hardware you should be going in for. So how do you select your hardware? Is that in fast track 2.0 there needs to be a memory guideline saying that or a per, per core you need to have four gig of memory. That guideline does not apply for fast track 3.0. Okay? There are reference configurations which are published based upon load and volumes. But if you are for your workload, one thing which you need to assume is that you need to assume that hash joins and sorts are definitely going to require extra memory. You need to plan for that if you have those kind of things. Okay? Now, are you going to use a caching technology and are you going to use a lot of cache feeds based upon your queries or the way you have modeled your data architecture? Then, probably the, again, it influences the memory, but disk workloads can be planned across. So, first thing is evaluate the maximum CPU consumption rate with your need, benchmark it with your workload, right, which means stress test it with your workload, compare both of them. And one thing which we recommend when we are going for the fast track kind of an architecture is that we have holistic use of data capacity at least for the next two or three years planned across. Because understand this, you are not going to run it on a SAM separately and this, then you just need to add your storage there. Your storage is going to be aligned to the CPU and memory which you are investing. So it's recommended you plan and calculate your user data capacity. In any fast track hardware, what happens is that you have rate 10 data runs and rate 10 log runs. Okay? The primary data, the temporary data, and as well as the primary staging database, which you have separately, are always going to be on the data runs. That's all they recommend placing it across. One very important thing is statistics. Always, by default, SQL Server has a configuration called as auto create and update statistics for improving performance. It is automatically enabled. By default, it is enabled. Please don't disable it. It's important that you use this particular parameter. And if you want to collect composite statistics for looper joints, you can do it at first. And please do not connect manual statistics on larger data sets because those are going to, again, have an impact in terms of your data for this performance. Okay? SQL Server supports page level compression. And when you use a fast track data warehousing architecture or when you build pretty much any large data warehouses, 
we recommend that you leverage compression and particularly fast track recommends you three times compression. Now, I don't want to make it as a blanket statement because not everything can be compressed for three times. Let's say if you have a dimension table, it just has 100 records. There is no sense in compressing it. Okay? Now, if you have billions of records on a fact table, it absolutely makes sense in compressing it. And again, compress it only when you know your workloads. If, you, if your workload is going to be random, please do not do so. Okay. Sequential or continu continuous organizing of files is something which starts right from the point when you create your database and extend allocation. Most of the time what I have seen in our experience is that if you don't plan your file group placement or how your file group should be organized in all of this, okay, there is going to be a scenario where your performance is going to struggle over a period of time. Okay? SQL Server has a stack-up option called as Hypeny. Okay? Now, what it does it at any given point of time when it wants to allocate extents, it allocates it as 64 extents at a time. Now that means your files are continuously organized. It's not like smaller units which gets organized, which increases the probability of just fragmentation. If you can pre-allocate what will be the size of your user databases, it is strongly recommended. We recommend avoiding auto group. If you are using our auto group, number one, always use increments of 4 MB. And then there's a trace flag called as 1117. Now what does the trace flag 1117 do is, let's say you have a file group. In the file group you have four or five different files available. How do you ensure that each of the files grow in an organized and equal size? It should not be in time one file grows bigger and one file is smaller. So it's important that we want to have an even growth of all the files. As we said, the memory, memory core 4 GB per, per core guideline does not apply anymore. And 48 or 64 from onwards, it gets much more better. Okay? Now, because you have rate time arrays, it reduces management com complexity. If you are using multiple path IO, each LAN or disk storage is configured as a separate drive in your Windows disk. One thing which you can leverage is the feature in SQL Server 2008 called as resource government. Now, why is it important? Is that, let's say if you are running a particular query. Okay? Now, that particular query, in order to load data consumes 25 percent of your available memory. Okay. Now, three queries concurrently you start running your entire memory, and you can get your system in bottleneck. So, if you want to throttle, saying that for this particular session, this is the maximum amount of memory which you want to allocate, the resource government will enable you to operate that class and work across with that. So, that's that you can leverage that feature. Not using max DOP in a data warehouse scenario, absolutely a wrong thing to do. Max degree of parallelism is a capability in SQL Server using which you set what is the number of processes which I can parallelly use. If you cannot allocate affinity to a processor saying that use processor 0 or processor 1 or processor 2, but it will make sure that if you say, let's say max DOP is, is equal to 1, it will use only one processor in order to run for that particular query. And we always recommend, and most of the recommendations which I have read from Microsoft says set up a max DOP. So far, Whatever we have discussed is right now something which is focused upon building large data warehouses. Now these best practices which I say can be implied across can be implied across for scenarios where you are building large data warehouses. The next section of it, what we are going to discuss is for a scenario where we want to build really large data warehouses, which is beyond 10 terabytes, probably going to hundreds of terabytes. That's exactly where the SQL Server parallel data errors comes into play. What is the SQL Server parallel data errors? This is nothing but a tier one enterprise data warehousing appliance offering. It comes from hardware partners like HP. Now, I have seen one of the data appliance on HP, which offers Conventional hardware offers symmetric multiprocessing, which is each of those units offers symmetric multiprocessing testing there for you. What this targets is massive parallel processing using a distributed architecture. That's what it targets. And because it uses a distributed architecture, you can have different layout architectures spanning across. And you can invest in this particular infrastructure for a hub and spoke architecture for one enterprise data warehouse and multiple data marts as well. So it's not like it's going to remove your consolidation strategy. It also helps you in your consolidation strategy. What does it have is that as per this particular, as you see in this illustration, it has a bunch 
of servers which is a part of your control graph. Okay? And then a bunch of servers and storage allocated across which is called as data. Each of the nodes, we will discuss each of the nodes, the, the control graph and data rack in detail. What does each of them consist of? The first node which I want to discuss is that of what we call the control node. The control node is primarily responsible for routing all the client connections. It doesn't do which server to go for, but all the client connections always go through the control node. It will not obviously it will not consist of user data because it's primarily a gateway. But with this particular approach, what happens is that you process SQL request and prepare execution plan. And each of these servers when it prepares its execution plan and and how uh, result, results is. What the control node does is that it works as an orchestrated, they create a distributed execution plan. So, it's, so each of those separate nodes, which is a compute node, is responsible for creating their own set of execution plan. The SQL server control node is probably aggregating all those plans and then orchestrating it and delivering it, delivering it across. Now, it supports ADO.NET client drivers, it supports open o o o ODBC and object linking and embedding and all this. Now, in this kind of infrastructure where you see so many servers, there is a larger problem where how do I patch these servers or how do I provide support of, or how do I monitor these servers or how do I fix a particular node if there is a problem. And if, let's say one of the nodes split in the data rack, how do I redeploy re the data rack? That's exactly what the management node is meant for. It provides support and patching for the appliance old image for of the deployment of the compute node and holds active directory as well. The landing zone is where you from where you run your EPL jobs or data processing into your data rack. Okay? And it can also be leveraged if let's say if you want to try some scripts as a sandbox or that run on an internal network, that can also be done. And it also provides you SQL Server integration services. Okay? From the source you get files into the data landing zone and then you use your data loader using what you call it, SSIs and then load into the compute nodes. So you can either use a DW loader which might which comes with HP or you can use SQL Server integration services. As a platform, the next consideration is how do we have a backup? Okay. So there's a backup node which is providing integrated backup solution. Now this can be variable in size. It need not be, the backup node need not be on the same size. Okay, so you can order it in different sizes with integrated third-party backup options like Veritas or Oxo or whatever it is. The data rack in this architecture which we are showing is somewhere around 10 compute nodes. Now in the compute node, it has an instance of storage dedicated to it, it has an instance of SQL Server dedicated to it, and the communication between them happens in infinite pan speed, so it's extremely fast. And the storage which each of them is allocated in this case might be a storage array like NSAP 2003. Okay, so each of them has the process the ability to process their local query. Okay, so if you have a query coming in for the data set which is available, each of them can process it and deliver it back. So that is something which becomes each of these nodes does it. So imagine what you have here is that let's say if you have 14 nodes which you saw here, you have a processing power in each of these servers. Let's assume it's having four nodes. You have a processing power of somewhere around 41 codes, plus that of each of them having 16 gig or 32 gig memory, you have 20 gig of memory. And the price points are not very high. I don't want to get into that because we don't want to get into that discussion in this session. It's out of scope. So how does MPP work or massive parallel processing work is that it, it consolidates multiple circuit multi-processing node to standard interfaces, provides dedicated hardware database and storage run SQL server and one spare node will be there in case of the node failure. Okay? Now this architecture which we are demonstrating is for SQL Server 2008. Okay? So that's where it says the rights are rate drives are configured as rate one. We are assuming that with SQL Server 2012 because I have not seen a SQL 2012 based period that we operate where it might actually be rate 10. So the way holistically it looks is there is one server which is for client drivers, one for support and patching, one for ETL, one for your corporate backup. How do we deal? The, the problem which most of them come back and ask is, already right, great, we have so much of parallel processing power and parallel, massive parallel processing and you can have full tons of data. But how do you lay out your data? Okay. 
there are three different approaches which we can take. Okay? One is you have a full copy of the table structure which is replicated across each of these servers or each of the nodes which are available in the servers. Or the other, now when you take that particular approach, you need to get into consideration if you have a billion rows on a table, all the billion rows are duplicated and replicated across the table. If you are fine with it, do it. But replicating structures or table structures is recommended only for smaller tables and not for big large tables. Or you can distribute it. What you can do is you can have it, a table structure in a PDW will hash down a single column and you can uniformly distribute it across. So this is something like data dependent routing where you say that okay, this is the data needed, that data is on the query should be routed on node one. If this is the data needed, you can route it to node two and then work across like that. The next step which is there is which I've discussed in detail is what we called as don't care anything, but it's actually what it is a hybrid model of the previous model which we did across. So what you can do is you can design a schema where you can distribute it across multiple nodes and then wherever the data is smaller, it can move small sets of data. So what it does is it extends this traditional share mapping design. So it pushes the share mapping architecture not only for the you remember in clusters we share share mapping for the test, but it actually pushes the share mapping architecture for IO, CPU nodes as well. So the benefits is that if you have queries which are coming in, you don't have contentions and you have maximum resource utilization for each of the queries. Okay? And you have multiple physical instances of tables. And the model which is used is as I discussed, large rows are distributed, small row tables are small tables are, rep are replicated across these hardware. Okay. Every component in these hardware has written as CPU, BIS, network, power, and storage processor. And control and compute nodes, primarily because those two are important, they use failover clustering. And man management nodes have active and standby states as well. So this is something what we have seen as an architecture which you can can work across for hundreds of terabytes of data and can deliver across efficient performance. So to summarize it, with SQL Server, there is no more a problem that whether we can achieve the performance which we need with SQL Server 2012 or 2008 for large data appearances. It can and it has done pretty much well in most of the scenarios which personally we have encountered. The thing is, in order to achieve successful performance and in order to deliver great performance and maximum value for money, it takes much more than then saying, that, okay, erect a server, throw the data on the data levels, run your ETL jobs, get out. Even what is more important is that how do you want to do your ETL jobs as well? Do you want it to be bulk inserts from flat files or ETLs from coming in from external sources? All of them are going to influence your performance decisions. But these are based upon experiences which we have shared it across. Now you might, you might, we didn't cover the scope of how you will use SSIS more efficiently or you will cover uh, SSAS more efficiently across in this. One thing which most of the people frequently ask me a question when we conduct this session is that if you are using SSAS, how do we ensure that this performance approach can be leveraged with SSAS as well? So what is important when you use SQL Server analysis services is that map your data partitioning which you are doing in your data warehouse to that of your data partitioning which you are actually doing in your analysis services as well. So like the way you map your feed to the partitioning scheme, align the partitioning scheme also to that of your analysis services infrastructure. But that there can be much more performance which can be achieved and delivered. From now on we can go for the questions. Okay, now let me try to... The first question which I have is why RAID, and, RAID 1 and why not RAID 1 plus 0? As I said, that's a SQL Server 2008 R2 infrastructure. I do not know why they went that particular route, but with SQL Server 2012, we definitely expect it to be RAID 12. The next question I have is I am just having a hard time reading the questions guys because the pain is different. 
The question which is asked is how data concurrency is managed in ultra share mapping architecture. Now there is not going to be a concurrency scenario happening because small tables you are replicating and large tables you are distributing. So you eventually know that if these are the records which you need to pick up based upon a range, you are going to go to that particular server and that's going to process. Now multiple rows are coming in across in order for the same query for the same data set. That's anyways going to be managed the way SQL Server manages, right? So it's going to be unique optimism for block escalation and non-blocking and all this kind of stuff. But again, these are not for end user queries which are directly running. It might be used just in order to load data into a particular analytics infrastructure and then take it out. How is SQL Server 2008 different from 2012? Now significantly, okay? Number one, as I said, there are page allocation enhancements and all this available in 2012. One critical feature which I would want, I'm talking only from the data warehousing perspective. There are other great features also available. There used to be a company, uh, IP called as Vertipack. Now, Vertipack gave a feature where you can organize, just like the you organize in cubes, you can aggregate it using something called as column store indexes in the data warehouse itself. So that's going to increase your performance significantly, but you have to be very careful when you're using it. That's one significant enhancement which we strictly see from the data warehousing perspective. But there are other enhancements which are huge from that are one enhancement which is very exciting is Project Present. Okay? With Project Present and the next versions of PowerView, okay, add up and self-service BI becomes much, much more simpler. Okay? That's one big enhancement which you see. And you will, I would also like to watch out for the SQL Server 2012 complex of processing engine. The first version was an acquisition and then incorporated in SQL Server 2007. Eight are two, sorry, but with the next version, we are also going to see significant enhancements on those components as well. Because what is and the one more feature which is important from SQL Server 2012 is it also has a data cleansing tool. Again, that's because of an acquisition which has been made for making sure duplicates are not there. Data is cleaned and loading in all this. You don't need to do it manually. You can do it leveraging this. And we expect. In SQL Server 2008, RQB introduced to the master data management services was introduced. In SQL Server 2012, we have, it was an ASP.NET client and it was not very conducive, but what we are expecting is that it's a single line based tool. Now, why not integrate it with analysis services, a question which most of them are asking, but I'm unfortunately not from the product group, so I can't answer why it is not yet happening. Whatever I was discussing about fast track is applicable to SQL. Any, the next question which I have is any update in SQL 2012 regarding data warehousing. As I discussed, whatever I discussed on the fast track section, all of them are applicable to SQL Server 2012. It's not applicable to SQL Server. Some of the best practices are, but most of them are applicable to SQL Server 2012, or focused on SQL Server 2012. And as the question which was asked, one of the significant updates from SQL Server 2012 data warehousing perspective, which I personally like, is what you call as the column store index. That's going to significantly improve query performances for many of the data warehousing scenarios. The next question which I have is at what scale the default SSAS configuration can be used? Well, it's a very tricky question, okay? Now, anytime when you use SSAS, there is always going to be fine tuning and modeling. Now there are two things. One is configuration. Okay. Now configuration you can use it, let's say if you don't want to do proactive caching or anything of that kind, then you can use some of the default configurations and run them. But what is more tricky in SSAS is that you need to plan what is your dimension model. You need to plan what is your storage architecture which you want to use. Once you plan both of them, whether you're going to have a distributed partitioning or you're going to have local multiple partition. Those are the kind of constraints which you need to think about. And the default SSAS configuration, I mean, not really in many cases you can just ask this use it. And it depends upon use case to use case to be honest. What are the best practices to avoid fragmentation? That's what I discussed. Number one is, if your data volumes are going to be very huge, use contiguous files. And as I said, use it, it starts right from that of your startup process. Allocate it in the, set up your SQL Server startup with the hyphening option. Allocate it across in multiple 4 MB units rather than that of 8K smaller extensions. Okay. Now the next thing which we need to do is avoid a lot of non-cluster indexes in a data warehouse. If you don't want it, don't have it. Because 
the probability of a non-clustered index, it increases at first in your test fragmentation. The next thing which we are saying is that use heap tables wherever possible and if you are using clustered indexes, make sure you are using clustered indexes for the right kind of columns. Fourth one, definitely invest on partition. If you don't do partitioning effectively for let's say billions of rows, you are likely going to have fragmentation. In a data warehouse, DML statements or a data manipulation statement like a select, insert or anything, from my opinion, I am not a great fan of it. The more you do your DMLs, the more it's going to suffer from the basis of performance. Next question is, do you have any design diagram on this topic? Can you please share those on screen? Now, unfortunately not, it's customer specific, but one thing I can do is I can point out or I can just type in a link in this particular group. Well, I can, when I share the presentation to take it, I can give you a link where you can pick up these design diagrams. Most of them are also best practices which standard in Microsoft Office, so we can share that out. Okay, if I understand this question right, somebody has asked me this question, what is your recommendation to build the large data warehouse in MS SQL Server 2008 or 2012? Now, that's what the whole session was all about, okay? But if you are asking whether it is currently built in 2012 or 2008, obviously being a newer version, and if you don't have reservations about being a new Microsoft product before Service Pack 1, I would go for 2012. I've always been personally an early adopter of most of the SQL Server products, and as long as you go through a proper benchmarking exercise and everything, I don't see a big risk. Even if you find out a bug, well, you have a known issue which probably will get resolved in the next service pack or anything. Which book is good for SQL 2012 for data warehousing on DBA, on DBA or which best site? Okay. SQL Pass community site is something which I will definitely recommend. Okay. Now, most of the MS Press books are good, but I'm waiting for a book which is going to be on a solution approach basis for SQL 2012. But SQLMAC.com and SQL Pass is something which you definitely recommend. Obviously, the reference architecture guides which are available in Tailwind and MSDN is something which you should definitely do. But wait until the solution approach kind of a book which is coming in for you. Excellent question. How SQL 2012 can be used efficiently with SharePoint 2010? Most of the reporting functionality or reporting infrastructure which you have can be integrated with SharePoint. So what happens is that if you're using SharePoint as a, del as a delivery platform for your enterprise, the reporting infrastructure can also be surfaced through that. So what happens, you don't need to go across, toggle across multiple tools in order to do it across with that. And you ha had this feature already in 2008, I called as remote block, R2 called as remote block storage. That will be much more enhanced leverage that was also with SharePoint 2000. Is there any specific infrastructure requirements for 2012? Yes, it is. Obviously, 2012 is going to be purely 64-bit, and then there's a Windows Server minimum requirement, and also the memories are higher. So if you can go into the Microsoft infrastructure requirements for RC0, because right now SQL Server is on RC0, these are documented in the product website. Is MS SQL Server 2012 proven in the market to implement data in this application? The whole point of SQL Server is proven. So SQL Server 2012 for proving itself doesn't have much. We are confident to prove itself. Okay. That's all of the questions I have at this particular point of time. If there are any more questions, we will just wait for another five minutes. And then we can take it further. There are a couple of more questions. Yeah, please. See in the chat pane. Is there, are those on the window? Yeah, in the same question span. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I got it, I got it. 
What's new in SQL Server 2012 from SSRS perspective? That's what is Project Present all about, okay? You have Power View, which is going to be a very significant feature. With Power View, what is also going to happen is that your ad hoc reporting and self-service provisioning is going to also be significantly enhanced. So if you are looking from an SSRS perspective, those two are the most critical features. How close is SQL Server DW with Cognos? Well, Cognos is a BI infrastructure. SQL Server DW is a data warehousing plus BI infrastructure. What do I mean by that is that Cognos primarily is targeted as a BI platform. It doesn't have a database platform itself. It works with everything. Now the goal with SQL Server is you have all in one. So you don't need to invest separately for a SQL Server a database and also a Cognos platform. And the philosophy of one thing which is there with Cognos is slightly different in SQL Server DW. Okay. One thing which is going to come in, which is going to cut us really closely with SQL Server BI in 2012 and Cognos is something called as business semantic information model, which is primarily what you call is that like just like the way Cognos does, SQL Server apart from analysis services is going to enhance it that person and have a semantic layer. Now what does it mean is that Let's say if you're writing a report, within the report you want to have data calculations and formulas, then there is something called as DAX, which is data access expressions, which is going to offer you this particular feature. So there's a lot to look out for from those perspective for anybody who is working on reporting, analysis services and all these comments. Does SQL Server 2012 have option to connect to SAP data sources and of SAP data connection managers? Excellent question. The thing is that SQL Server in itself does not offer you those particular components. Now, there are a lot of occasions where I've pulled SQL Server dates, SAP data out into SQL Server 2012. The options to do it is that if you use SAP, SAP has something called as the Enterprise Common Gateway, or they call it ECG, probably not right to use it from a health context. So what you can do is you can use your SSIS jobs to connect with the web servers available from ECG and fetch the data and then harmonize and process that process. Okay, so the, the next thing is that SAP anyway is offers you the gateway. So you can consume it from that particular gateway using that. And there might be some third party OLTP providers which I'm not aware of, but are of my approach which I have taken in the past has been this approach. Give your email for future reference type. Um, well, that's something which, uh, well, I think so, I'll be there in the tech geek community, so you can reach me there in that particular place. Which one better, either tabular model or multidimensional model in SSAS? SSAS is primarily tailored for multidimensional models, not for tabular models, okay? Now, it can't be a blanket statement, it's like uh, asking me a question, which food you like, you like Chinese or Indian, no, it's relative, right? So it has to be applied to your scenario. Because conventionally, it's for multi-dimensional analysis is what SSA is a bit of. Now, you are constrained if you can't use SSA, is, okay? But if you still want a good query performance with the data errors, okay? Then what you can do is you can use the data errors directly in a tabular model, use a column index tool in order to achieve performance not necessarily as good as SSA is, but close to that of SSA is. I'll say 50% close to that of SSA is, you can still offer. Are there any more questions? Because I think I'm at the end of it. Yeah, I think we have answered uh, all of the questions. I'm uh, getting one more question I'm sharing. I think we have one more. SSIS 2008 lacks XML destination transformation. Is it now available in SQL Server 2012? To be honest, I'm not tried it. So, I don't know. But if I find it out by dabbling my hands around, I'll definitely post it back on the page. Uh, I think uh, we can conclude this session now. Okay. Once again, thanks a lot for all the people who have attended. And I think I missed answering one question. I just saw it right now because the question pane is difficult to handle. 
Control of RAC is hardware or MS SQL Server. The answer is both. Okay. It's not just hardware or software, it's both of them. And once again, the SQL Server showed decrease of performance on VMware. Nothing that which has been proven. Okay. We have not seen anything which has been proven in that particular context where it is lower on VMware. But if you are marrying Microsoft technologies or whatever is married across platform, because there are tons of customers there we have seen it run on VMware. Nothing which has been significantly because of VMware being an issue performance at supper. No. It pretty much does very well on VMware as well. But if you are using Hyper-V, your Microsoft will be happy or also be happy with us. All right, so we can end the session right now. Yeah, we can continue. Okay. Thanks Mr. Sriram for your informative session on building large data warehouses leveraging SQL Server 2008 and SQL Server 2012. It was indeed an enlightening session. I would also like to thank our participants for the support in making this webinar a huge success. The recording of this webinar will be available on techgeek.com by tomorrow. The next session in cloud computing series is happening tomorrow, 12 January at 3 p.m. Topic for tomorrow's session is deploying models and service models in cloud computing. We will be having Mr. Rohit Goel, consultant, Microsoft as our guest speaker. So see you all tomorrow. Have a nice day. Thank you.